Imagine the situation that you have a family which moves from one country to another. And this family has a bunch of kids, and those kids grow up in this family. Um, at first, they're only exposed to the language spoken in the family. Let's say if we look at the United States, it could be a Korean or a Russian family living in New York, and the kid listens to Korean or to Russian. But then this kid starts going outside and playing with other kids. Then the kid goes to preschool and starts learning some English, no matter how hard the parents try not to expose that kid to English at first. So at some point, the kid becomes bilingual in the home, fam home language and in the English that's spoken around him or her. And eventually, what happens is that the kid becomes more dominant in English, and their Russian or Korean becomes much weaker, to the point that sometimes when children are in middle school, they stop speaking the home language and start talking to their parents in English and parents still try to talk to them in the home language. So this is the breakdown of communication. So the end point of this bilingualism is what's called heritage language. So essentially it's a form of bilingualism which is known as um, receptive or recessive bilingualism. Um, in an ideal world, you would imagine that being bilingual means knowing two languages really, really equally well. But it's almost like the notion of an ideal husband which is you know, not an existence prob non-existent probably. So even if someone is very stably bilingual, one of the languages wins, and so they know one for like 51% and the other for 49%. And you can usually tell by seeing um, what people do in those languages when they count or when they're scared. This is when you see the dominant language at work. So heritage language is uh, the phenomenon of recessive bilinguals, when one of the two languages becomes much, much weaker. But what makes those languages special is that um, the heritage language is the language which is acquired first, started at birth. So the dominant language is the one that comes in second or even third and kicks out the previous languages. The reason those languages are interesting, and that is heritage language, is that uh, they allow us to see what's vulnerable and what's strong in human language in general. The field is fairly new. It's been around for, let's say, 15 years. But as we've been looking at more and more instantiations of heritage language, we've been noticing that regardless of what the dominant language is and regardless of what the heritage language is, there are a lot of recurrent tendencies which indicate that there is this kind of general architecture that human languages are organized by, and this architecture underlies the process of language learning. So by looking at heritage languages, we're able to reveal more of this linguistic blueprint that languages are organized by. Uh, the other reason that heritage languages are particularly interesting is that uh, there is this theory which was actually developed by a Russian linguist, Roman Jakobson, who used to teach here at Harvard. And the theory was first in, last out. Or as Jakobson would say, first in, last out. Because the joke goes that Jakobson spoke Russian in six languages. So the first in, last out theory is that whatever is acquired early is forgotten the least and is lost last. Let's say when per people start losing their language, when they start forgetting language because of brain in injury or because of aging. There is a particular sequence of events which we all go through as we learn our first language. And by looking at heritage languages, we can trace back the same sequence by turning it backwards. So in a way, um, heritage languages will give us the um, replay of acquisition um, trajectory. The first and last out is certainly just a hypothesis. And so it's important not only to take it for granted, but to test it. And that's what we've been doing a lot with heritage languages. If you look at heritage speakers, mm, let's say in the United States, where there are a lot of immigrants and a lot of heritage languages, we find that there is tremendous variation across those speakers. There are some speakers who are very good, and uh, they can even maybe pass for a native speaker for a little while. And there are some speakers who can barely say, I love you, Grandma, and I need $20, which is essentially what they use the heritage language for. So those speakers are probably particularly interesting for us. And in my, my lab, we mostly study the comprehension of those heritage speakers who are very, very weak. Sometimes these people are called overhearers, which means that as they were growing up, they overheard the language and they were exposed to it to a certain degree. But they can't really produce it. 
So the question is how much they understand. And again, when you address this question, um, it depends very much on who you ask. If you ask the parents of these people, they'll say, oh, my kid understands everything. If you ask these people, they'll say, well, I may understand something. And so the truth is, as usual, in the middle, because they do understand a certain number of things. But the impression or the illusion that they understand a lot comes from the fact that they're often in such pragmatic situations where it's clear what's going on. Because, you know, if you need the car keys, there are not too many ambiguities. If you need to say, I love your grandma, it's unlikely that you'll say something different. But if you put them in a situation where they have to dis distinguish between ambiguous sequences or where they have to choose between things which look very similar, it's really hard for them. And this is where their vulnerabilities come through. So, so far I've described the general kind of picture of heritage language and I've identified two uh, reasons why these languages are so important. Because on the one hand, they allow us to see uh, the structural underpinnings of natural language. And on the other hand, they allow us to test uh, the first and last out hypothesis, retracing the, tr um, the uh, steps of child language acquisition. So let's take a look at um, some instances of heritage languages as spoken in the United States, which is the area where we do a lot of work. We have very large pockets of um, heritage speakers of uh, Cantonese, Korean, Russian, um, Hindi, um, and Sp Spanish. And so these are the main groups that we've been studying in my lab. What we do is uh, we try to study large groups of people because this immediately allows us to put a handle on variation across heritage speakers. Um, we tend to ask for people who can't read and we try to select those heritage speakers who are not really interested in relearning their language. Um, you'll be surprised how many people of that sort you find. However, there are also some heritage speakers who grow up with very little interest or even rejection of their home language. But when they go to college, they suddenly decide, oh, I want to learn it. Like, why would I go learn German, whereas, you know, I can go and study Korean, which I learned as a child. They typically go to those classes because they expect that they're going to get an easy A in the class. And they very quickly discovered, the, uh, discovered that they won't get an easy A, but instead it's really hard for them to read. And it's really, really hard for them to be next to someone who's studying Korean as their second language because they've never been exposed to Korean in a classroom setting. So what we see in those speakers is um, a set of three main factors. One is uh, that they retain some of the features which are typical of child language because this is where they're interrupt interrupted in their acquisition. So you see a 20-year-old um, heritage speaker who will be using some baby words. They will say something like, my tummy hurts, or they will call someone who they would be supposed to be calling politely with some child words. And uh, this is a phenomenon which we know from fossilization of child language. The fact that certain features are fossilized more than others tells us that there are some features in language which are harder to learn than others. Just to give you an example, verbs are generally easier to learn than nouns. And uh, despite the fact that children start speaking with nouns, we do see more mistakes in nominal morphology than we see in the verbal morphology, regardless of the baseline language. Even if your language has very complicated verbal morphology and the nominal morphology is not very difficult, the kids actually, not the kids, sorry, the heritage speakers stumble upon nominal morphology more so. So the first um, component then is this fossilization of um, particular childhood features. We have a project which we just started where we started looking at Heritage English. And it's very interesting because you think of English as this invincible language which conquers the world and nobody can lose it. But if you think about communities where there are large numbers of expa expatriates who have children, this is where you see possibilities for Heritage English. So we have three projects running, one in Israel, one in France, and one in Japan. In all three countries, you have large expat communities, and the kids in those communities are more dominant in Hebrew, French, or Japanese. So if we look at their English, we start saying that they show the same heritage features that we saw, for example, in Heritage Korean or Heritage Russian as spoken in Boston. 
And these kids do exactly the same things as young children learning English do. So for example, they double uh, the past tense morphology. So if you take the verb to dress, the regular past tense is dressed, and a lot of them will say dress it did, or talk, talked, talk it did, um, went, wented, and so on. So this is a very typical feature. So I'm still talking about the fossilization of um, child language. Another feature or another factor which shapes heritage grammars for us is um, the obvious transfer from um, the base, the dominant language that these people speak. So let's say we have people who are <coughs> heritage speakers of English and who live in France or in Israel. In those languages, French and Hebrew, uh, we normally put adverbs right after the verb. So you have things like, I often read, uh, I read often this newspaper. And um, this is what they transfer into their um, English. And then finally, the, thir the third feature, which is particularly interesting, is the feature uh, which has to do with the development of universal properties of natural language. And that's what we're after. We're trying to see what it is that all these heritage languages will share, which will make them more alike and less different from each other. To wrap it all up, um, we, um, we've been talking about different properties of these languages. And like I said, this is a new field. So there have been two main um, directions of inquiry. One is collecting empirical data on these languages. And the other is identifying general theoretical questions. The second component has led to this um, development that I mentioned. Um, looking at fossilization of child language interference from the dominant language and universal properties. The next uh, steps have to do with uh, more experimental work on these languages because we now have a fairly good idea as to what exactly can go wrong and what exactly is pretty robust. So we need to find more empirical data on that. And then, of course, the next step is to explain what goes on. Uh, why is it that people universally keep more verbs than they keep nouns? What is it about the nature of nouns as opposed to the nature of verbs that makes them more vulnerable? So hopefully in a couple of years we will know what exactly it is that drives um, the existing fine-grained differences in those heritage languages. <laughs>